Välkomna till Anime 7 session, podcasten där vi pratar om Anime 7 eller andra saker som vi tycker mycket om. Jag heter min Nixi och jag är här med min co-host Zorak. Uh, yeah, same. All right, so welcome back to another episode of Animation Dissection. Today we are going to be talking about the Marvel superheroes and Spider-Man cartoons from the mid to late 1960s. So, uh, Zorak, why did we pick this topic? Uh, for one, just because they're very goofy, and it just we just thought it would be very fun to talk about. Of course. Uh, the other aspect is that Marvel is doing some weird shit where they're going to be sort of altering their timeline or referee for financial reasons tied to Disney stuff. But I just thought it would be kind of interesting to go back and just use it as an excuse to look at some of these older animations, some of the first Marvel animation ever made. And boy, are they really fucked up. But um, before we do that, let's cover some brief news. Animation news time! <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, so... um. The first bit of news is kind of more fun news. Um, so Steven Universe opened up applications for storyboard artists. Uh, one of the directors on the program, Ian Jones Quarterly, on Twitter and I think on Tumblr, posted a kind of an image that said, hey, we're accepting applications. Send your portfolio and information to this email address. Um, it was then taken down only a couple hours later because of the absolute overwhelming response. So... Um, Considering the amount of uh, fandom and fan artists and just the amount of talent out there, I'm not surprised it was so quickly overwhelmed, especially how well the show has done and I think, you know, how anyone would jump at the chance to work at it. So I do not envy the person who has to go through all the portfolios. Um, I don't know if they're going to continue with what they had or if they're going to have to come up with a new way of posting it later. But it was uh, kind of crazy and, uh, and emblematic of the way talent is often discovered online now also kind of indic- kind of also indicative of how hard it is to find animation work these days yes so i do have to <laughs> wonder how much of that is also tied into just like you said like how much of it was amateurs applying or how much of it was actual professionals applying it's going to be a mix of both i mean again there's there is quite a lot of talent out there in doing fan Certainly. art and things like that so there there's definitely a lot to pick from but of course there's always going to be amateurs even if it isn't listed you know publicly like this and but I'm again sure i'm sure they're not complaining about all the attention that they're getting simply because even if it's a lot to sort through it does allow them to filter through a lot and just pick the best of the bunch so to speak Oh yeah, it's just going to take a lot of man hours. <laughs> so if they've got people on staff, probably specifically who's that's their entire job and resources. All right, yes, they got to do something, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, but either way, uh, we're, we'll keep you posted if anything else changes on it, because um, they said they're going to have to repost and maybe change how they do the standard for who applies, because it was just way too much, I think, for even them to handle. So, um, and the other piece of news, uh, not so good, uh, kind of mixed here. So that big class action lawsuit going against a a lot of the uh, CG animation companies in a wage-fixing cartel where they were communicating the pay scales between each other and kind of making it so there's no competition for workers and thus suppressing the wages, a uh, judge has thrown out that case temporarily. Yeah, essentially the reason why it was thrown out is that the the instances instances in question happened over four years prior to the filing, but the filing was actually timed specifically with some revelations with regards to uh, statements by Disney president at Catmull, where he did some depositions associated with some other sort of tech trials, I believe, that kind of in- basically outright stated the fact that there was some price fixing going on, and then the, the law the animation tied lawsuit followed and. There are supposedly allowances that basically said that the four-year kind of statute of limitations doesn't apply if it's if you simply don't know prior to that time. So, you know, it starts at when you actually know that there's a fixing, and they're saying that there's not enough evidence being presented that indicates that they simply didn't know. And they have to show that there were deliberate intention by the parties involved to mislead people involved, which is a kind of a weird thing to say that, hey – Disney, you don't have enough evidence to show that these people and companies involved in price fixing weren't hiding the fact that they were price fixing when that's intrinsically illegal. Yeah, so they're basically implying that the employees were in on it somehow, which is kind of <laughs> which is kind of goofy. And the very bit. fact that the there well, is d- is it sta- like they're thinking it's oh it's just it it became accepted practice therefore it's not illegal is that almost like what they're saying? 
I don't know. I think that I think it because might just so be the that open? the judge is pushing it back in the sense that there's not enough in the initial sort of what's been presented to her hmm. that there's not enough mic in that specific argument. So it may very well be that you know the appeal th- there is an appeal process where they can appeal within the next thirty days, and it may very well be that this sort of rejection is itself a technicality. It's hard to say. Yeah, I mean we'll we'll see how things go. You know it. I, there's a lot of money involved on the other end, so... Yeah, I mean, um, up at, at a lot of the um, animation festivals, so like CTN Expo and SIGGRAPH, it was a big conversation going on, especially with the way that the worker rights and the pay scale. And again, it, it's an extension of the what's going on in the tech industry and a lot of other industries, but animation was really hit hard by this. Um, VFX, uh, there were quite a few protests. Um I don't know if you remember a few years ago, I think, uh, I don't think it was around Life of Pi. I think it was actually before this, but uh, a lot of VFX people had changed all their avatars online, both like Facebook and Twitter, to just uh, bright green squares to represent the uh, the green screening technology. And it was kind of a protest uh, during the award season to kind of say like, hey, you know, none of these movies that you guys have on here would be looking the way they do or be made without us. And we're treated and paid like crap. So I, it's not a new problem, but it definitely got a whole bunch of attention, especially when um, uh, I think a couple of reporters on Pando Daily uncovered quite a bit of what was going on there. Mm-hmm. So uh, moving on, we got email, email time. So uh, we got a, a nice quick short one from uh, Mekion. Hello, friends, Nixi and Zorak. In regards to a comment on the latest podcast in respect to G.I. Joe having been animated in Japan, it almost certainly was. Sunbow, producers of the G.I. Joe and Transformers cartoons, would generally outsource to Toei Animation and Acom during this time, along with one or two other mostly unknown studios. Regards, Mekion. So I'm I'm sure you enjoyed this one because I was wrong and you were right. <laughs> I've, 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 I've always called the fact that some... Some of those shows, and many of those shows from the 80s, just look anime as fuck. And you know what? I'm right. Yep. Uh, uh, I, mean, that's, I remember... That's kind of a lot of the outsourcing uh, worked at the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, a lot of the Deke shows, like, um, God, I think the Heathcliff show and the Cadillac Cat things, that was all animated in Japan, too. And they definitely didn't look like regular American cartoons. I think also, um, what's his name? Uh, Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget was, like, very oh, yeah. much, yeah, heavily influenced by that. Turtles, too, to the point where... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had some, you know, Japan-specific and, you know, uh, original stuff that I don't know if they actually made it out over here. Hmm. You know, I think I think also the uh, a bunch of the Ghostbuster shows were also animated in Japan. I wouldn't be surprised. And even, like, the openings to cartoons. Just oh, yeah. the openings. Tons like uh, openings, yeah. sw- uh, Not SWAT. Oh, well, SWAT Cats was probably animated in Japan uh, for the opening. But uh, the other Cats one, uh, Thundercats. That intro is definitely not animated in the U.S., <laughs> Yeah. I mean, outsourcing is always, well, not always, but it's been a thing for a few decades now, and it's still a thing now. Just now it's going mostly to Korea, I'd say. Oh, yeah, definitely. At least, I mean, even Japan outsources to Korea for certain things. Oh, yeah. Um, I, If I recall correctly, there was a, an anecdote from one of the people, I think, at Rocco's Modern Life, where some of the stuff they outsourced got mixed up with the G.I. Joe things. So suddenly... um the background would be switched with like a GI Joe background, like the footage they get back. So like the characters who are supposed to be sitting on a couch are suddenly in this like secret base. Or, I like or, that. I hope they kept it like that. Cause that sounds pretty good. I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it was Rockus modern life, but I mean, I've heard of other shows in the U S with people behind the scenes, like getting those types of mix ups back. I mean, that's what you have to do for retakes. And that's a part of the director's job uh, is making sure everything, you know, comes back. Okay. And the communications work out. All right. So let's get on to, um, uh, the background between, uh, not between, for the Marvel superheroes and Spider-Man. So Marvel superheroes came first back in 1996. It was produced at uh, Grant Ray Lawrence Animation, and it consisted of, I think, four or five of the main characters there. So it was, let's see, Thor, Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, and the Submariner. And I know each character themselves as a series would get 13 episodes each. And the animation itself was extremely limited. I mean, yep. when we say limited animation, like, no, this is super duper limited. I mean, they did use original art from the comics and they essentially 
fo- used kind of a photocopying process to put them onto cells and then would animate on top of them or animate pieces of them, usually just the mouths or arm movements and things like that. I mean, this is you, it's using the same technical process that Disney used to translate their pencil drawings to cell, like they did that for 101 Dalmatians and things like that because they just wanted to skip doing the inking process. And sometimes that looks great and sometimes that looks like absolute garbage. So just because they use the same technique doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be bad, but in this case, it... It, it doesn't it, look that bad. It's just that the animation itself is just not not there. Sometimes the, the, the panels don't look that good, though. I mean, yes, oh, it's yeah. using comic art, but sometimes those... And, and the other thing I find with them is that the consistency is way off. Cause, and even within the same comic, in the comics thing, they're not necessarily as trained as artists to make sure everything looks perfectly consistent. So yeah. sometimes you'll get characters' facial details much. get really messed up because people use context to fill it in. With animation... And, and cutting things back and forth with actual time versus the implied time of a page, it, it screws with your brain. So you, we definitely get some interesting um, effects out of there. And then we'll just skip quick, real quickly to the background on Spider-Man. The first season of Spider-Man. So it was three seasons and it started after the Marvel superhero season. Um, it was like uh, 1967 through 1970. Mm -hmm. Um, the first season was animated by the same guys that did the Marvel superheroes, uh, Grant Trey Lawrence animation, but the production values were vastly greater for this one. Yes. Um, they actually animated it. They didn't use uh, original art in some ways. It was better. Like as in there's more actual animation in it in other ways. It's special. It, It looks kind of special. Um, but then, after the first season, the uh, production was switched over to uh, a new studio, Krantz Films, with Z at the end, uh, for a second and third season. And these were directed by the famous animator, Ralph Bakshi. And the, stylistically, not only is it like a difference in, in, in the visuals, by far, but also the, the plots changed. And it went from being a, you know, 10, 11 minute episodes to something like 24 minutes per episode. So like a standard half hour long TV series. Um, and the visuals, you know, I would say they're a lot more ambitious. You know, the backgrounds were kind of like interesting in a lot of ways. Like they had this phantasmagoric psychedelic sky with like paint washes and different colors and texture. Um, the the layouts and the way they edited things together were just a lot more ambitious. It was still terrible though. <laughs> the I mean, the plot the plot certainly also more ambitious in the sense that it gains plot. The first season is much more episodic in terms of you know it was written to be very episodic and kind of standalone, like a Hanna and, Barbera TV version, right? Of and something. then when it, and then when it transitions to the second season where you have you know. Uh, Grant's films doing it. It, ga- it actually goes back and does the origin story and attempts to do sort of plot based off, I believe, specific chapters from the comic. I don't know how actually accurately or correctly they follow them, but it, it becomes much more dynamic in terms of the plot, though. It's still kind from- of silly. It also looks kind of like their their means certainly were surpassed by their ambitions because they have to do a lot to fill time. And that's, I would say that's a very charitable way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, let's hope that they had ambitions and this wasn't just them crapping something out because. Well, I mean, the oh very boy. fact that they're doing plot <laughs> at all seems itself. Well, I mean, visually. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the fact that they're trying to do that sort of thing on TV seem, is kind of crazy for the era. Yeah, considering their budget and the time sk- the time restrictions, I bet. I mean, and I, I I will give them credit where credit's due. A lot of the backgrounds, I think, from the second season on are really interesting and well done and colorful and kind of remind me of some of the better background work you would see in, like, even Scooby-Doo and things like that, where they'd have some, you know, really well-painted backgrounds for establishing shots. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the first season, the backgrounds just felt like bo- colored boxes, with maybe a couple little like furniture pieces thrown in, in. Them it was here and there. They 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 weren't textured. They weren't you know they were just very serviceable backgrounds. Whereas this right. one tried to be much more expressionistic, and I felt that was definitely I think uh, Ralph Baxi's uh, touch. Uh, I think he brought in one of his own uh, background artists that he likes to work with 
uh, for working on this one. Um, there is some interesting background to how the transition from Grant Ray Lawrence to Krantz was and the eventual collapse of Krantz. Um, if you want to read more about it, I think Bakshi has a autobiography about his early days in the animation industry. So that would definitely be worth something checking out if you want more background on that. So uh, let's talk some of the episodes that we ended up watching. Uh, maybe we should start with, I guess, uh, temporally some of the first ones. So Thor, uh, Marvel Superheroes. Yeah, so the Thor cartoon, or if just especially let's let's dial back a bit. So let's talk a little bit about what Thor is conceptually. Just so if you're listening to this and haven't actually watched it, you have kind of a clue what we're talking about. So or don't read Thor, the comics like me, <laughs> right? So Thor is you know based around the Norse mythology figure of Thor, you know the thunder god, and the whole kind of idea behind it is that Thor comes down to Earth inhabits the merges with the body of a human being which is kind of weird and basically has this alter ego where he falls in love with some woman on earth and the god odin his father doesn't really approve of this and his brother half brother fake brother whatever uh loki is well he, he's loki and therefore an asshole and evil and basically all the plots for these episodes are really similar to ways that are kind of funny. And since it's basically just all Odin being really annoyed that Thor's dating a human lady and is not really falling to his, you know, where he wants them. And then Loki d comes up with some plan to fuck with Thor and things happen. And eventually Thor just kind of punches Loki for a while. And then Odin's like, well, maybe I shouldn't have trusted Loki. Oh, well. and his outfit changes a dozen fucking times. <laughs> well, let's also not forget that Loki is is blessed with one of the the best voices possible. Where he's well, he sounds like, like Skeletor. Ah, he man, I mean, Thor, I'll get you this time with my cunning and a Nordstone. I wonder if he was the actual inspiration for the voice acting that they did for Skeletor eventually. It, it would be funny if it was, but oh man, I mean, here when a villain has a ridiculous voice like that, it, there's no way to take him seriously in any way, shape or form. That's great. But I, again, what I, what I, I remember when we were screening these, uh, one of the things I pointed out is just because each episode is basically the same. And how, how does Odin not realize after the fourth or fifth time, it's like, Hmm, maybe I shouldn't take Loki at his word immediately. Why should I, tr I should totally trust Loki, you know, the trickster god and the you know, one that the father five of lies previously has tried to trick me in the ex and not not just that he's tried to trick me but he's tried to trick me in the exact same way the best part is also there were things like in, like in the beginning of the episode like loki tricks him and it's like i don't know it's like loki's tr trying to trick me right now but on the other hand i'm really annoyed about this whole thing with thor dating this lady so i'm going to i'm going to go along with this anyway like, he, he, he gets kind of, like, hints where he's kind of like, I don't know if I should be going with this, but I'm gonna. <laughs> and and, and as, as the joke was made, Odin in this cartoon has both his eyes. And in Norse mythology, Odin ends up sacrificing one of his eyes to get, you know, not, you know, near omniscience and, you know, and really good wisdom. And so clearly he's fucked up. He hasn't sacrificed his eye yet here. See, I would argue that, he doesn't even need to remove an eye to have this basic pattern recognition. So my, my vote is that he has Alzheimer's before he loses the eye. Maybe that's what drove him to it. I mean, you know, uh, at the same time also, uh, one thing I really do like about this is that it, for what it is, which is just, you know, animating comics, I presume, I don't know anything about the actual issues that it's animating, if it is how well it reflects it. It has a, a fun sort of like kind of mythology esque feel to it in general, in the sense that it feels kind of like those random things like, Oh, you know, in mythology, I could totally believe that Loki's g m several times goes ahead and just tricks people. And people are just kind of like, well, we'll beat up Loki for a while, but then we'll just let him get over it because ah, eh, whatever, you know, we're gods, you know, we, who cares? we need a villain for next week or, or well, no, like just in the <laughs> mythology sense, like, eh, well, it, that was fun. You know, whatever, you know, it's like if you're immortal, how much you care about that kind of crap, I guess. Or or they're just so bored, they need something. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, well, there'll be something to do for a while. And well, Odin's like, just so pissed about Thor. One of the things I love Thor. is that, like, um, 
what what is it? Thor, Thor often credits or Odin goes like, ah, the power of love saved the day again. It's like, really? Because like the, the love is mentioned, but she's such a nothing character throughout this entire thing that like it barely registers. I mean, I understand that's supposed to be the impetus for the the kind of like the conflict where it's like, oh, Odin's angry that he's in love with this this human woman. But she's nothing. There's she doesn't no, really have a personality other than the sense like, oh, she's, she's she gets a hard upset worker and she kind of likes Thor and or Thor's alter ego. And that's kind of like, that's it. She doesn't have a personality beyond that. I mean, at one point she falls for uh, Hercules and that, they, you know, that's kind of a thing. But beyond so she's that, like it's olive oil. Like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, kind of what they're going for with it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's there to be basically the, the object of obsession. There's not much to her. I and mean, it's not to be honest, there's not much to Thor either, where the whole thing with Thor in mythology is that Thor is a huge, like kind of thick headed idiot and asshole. Yeah. Whereas well, Thor here is like so years. noble that it just doesn't really mesh. Well, it's 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 dull. There's no conflict. Whereas, well, let's talk about the Hulk then, where they at least introduce. I mean, as hokey as the episodes end up being, like the basic premise is interesting. Where it's someone at conflict with themselves. You know, he's not all powerful. He's not all good at all times. So there's actually conflict going on, and yeah, I mean, you don't know the, how it's going to resolve. Which is interesting in the sense that like, the Thor ones that we watch meshes kind of with what Thor is in the comics today, other than Thor is more of a huge idiot now which mm. is kind of how he should be. Whereas the Hulk ones feel kind of like they have the precursory kind of n- idea of like how Hulk is like in all modern sort of stuff where it's like, Hey, he's a guy who's like smart, but his fears turns him into a monster or, you know, his anger turns him into a monster here. He's basically just the werewolf or he's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. High. There's not much else to him. He's kind of like an outline of himself. Yeah. Like he he they haven't really attached a lot of narrative meat to him yet or a lot of backstory and again like the whole uh, werewolf aspect and Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde thing is a lot more clear. Uh, yeah, it's I mean not, it's certainly... not triggered by his emotions or anything like that. And it's the night and day literally where it's like oh the moon's up or or it's like nighttime he's turning into the Hulk. Though so that first episode we watched the origin one which was called uh, uh, the origin of the Hulk. Like, he specifically, when he transforms, he goes and stomps out, you know, like, freaking out. Like, oh, why am I, you know, here, locked up? I don't want to be locked up, you know? And even then, he's like, he finds a photo of himself, and he's basically like, who's this puny, you know, lame Like, that ain't me. I ain't puny and weak like that. Where, but, it, the, he, but then he says, I have to get revenge on humanity for what they did to me. So yeah. he, he, he simultaneously has memory and doesn't have... I mean, okay, we're criticizing these cartoons for not being consistent within themselves, let alone episode to episode, and it might be asking too much. I mean, the, mm. the plots of these are kind of ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the Thor one we saw with the... It was like the test of the gods. Yeah. And and the, the, the funniest thing is that... So, you know, it's yet again one of those uh, episodes where it's like... Hey, Odin, take a look. It's Thor. He's in love with a human woman. I am angry that he's in love with a human woman. Also, my hat changed colors. Oh, God. Is that, and... can, we, can we pause real quick and talk about... Okay, so one <laughs> thing with these episodes is that they don't... Not only do they not want to animate much and that they did a lot of scanning of panels, they reuse panels from, like, previous episodes constantly or do they just reuse panels from everywhere. So in any single Thor episode that you watch... Odin changes outfit every single frame. It or is... if not outfit, color. So none of the colors. Basically, this is what happens when you don't have a production designer at all. Like literally not. Like continuity is like one of the most basic positions on any film set. This just doesn't have it. And it's it's kind of, it's, I don't know if it's made better that way. It's funnier because of it, because the characters from one it's, sentence it's to the next will just look entirely different. I mean, even Loki, his his head changes constantly. And I have to imagine that's because they're they're taking stuff from you know other issues of the comic. Maybe oh yeah, it's out of, it's out of context just, you know, panels. We're we're basically oh his outfit and this one's different. But with like Odin, he's like literally changing between every single shot, and it is hysterical because it's like oh. His, his hat's got, you know, he's got this crown on, and now he's got this thing with, like, an eagle on his head. And now it's got horns? And it's like, oh, man, like, you have to just imagine and internalize the fact that Odin is literally just constantly changing his outfit every frame. And that is 
wonderful. It's even more than what you see in a One Piece movie. <laughs> like even more than Oda does he change character outfits. It's pretty... yeah, it's, it's 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 hysterical. Like he's in he, Odin is so much more than anything else. I mean, I I have to imagine it's because like in the Source comics, maybe Odin just has the weirdest outfits because like what else? Well, it's you also do with different Odin? artists. You know, yeah, they weren't always the same artists. So like that's why stylistically, some people's faces just change. Yeah. Though with but, um... Odin, it is the best. <laughs> but anyways, with with the with the episode you're talking about, the uh, where the at the mercy of Loki, like I think Loki sneaks down to Earth, and he pretends to be like a sick guy with like a cane. Oh well, yes, wait, yes. Wait, wait. First, he turns into a fly to get pa- to get to Earth. A, uh, a bee. A bee. Yes, he sneaks down, and then the guy, all seeing guy, is like, "Oh, bee flying down to Earth. Well, that's normal. Whatever." And then basically he gets down there, he pretends to be a sick guy with a cane, and he switches his cane with uh, Thor's alter ego, ego, which is like Dr. Blake something, I think. Well, then, either way, they both have canes that look exactly alike. And, yeah, even, and, and then Thor's basically... alter ego says, this old man, he has a cane just like mine. Oh, he fell over. I'll give you your cane. And then they Thor, switch canes. I mean alter ego, doctor. This yeah, and then he suspicious. throws. Okay, so he takes the cane and he he just like, oh, I feel good now. And throws Thor's cane outside the window and just immediately goes, I, actually, I'm Loki. I'm gonna take your girlfriend and leave now. And just does that. And then Thor just literally just has to walk outside to pick up his cane, which is, is actually his hammer, transform and just like go after him in the middle because, of the street too. Yeah, because the entire thing about this is that he just want Loki wants to take Thor's girlfriend to Asgard or Valhalla to, or whatever. To, yeah, to violate the law of a mortal being there. Yeah, it's like and, 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 and immediately that, that, yeah, that, Thor that, shows yeah. up and is like, give me my girlfriend back and he's like, oh, look at this. Thor brought his girlfriend here to make her a god. Totally. And it's like, like and Odin's like, well, you're a lying piece of shit, Loki. But on the other hand, he is hugging his girlfriend here, so I'm going to trust you. I'll let you guys <laughs> do a I'll let you guys have a trial here. You, you can have a race through a bunch of crap. No using powers. I, none of you guys will cheat, right? And Loki obviously and, and cheats because that's what he does. And don't worry. During this test, I won't even be watching. I'll be busy taking a bath somewhere else entirely and then asking people how it's going occasionally. <laughs> yes, taking a bath and then imme- someone comes in like, hey, you know Loki's cheating right now, right? He's like, what? How can this be? Goes uh, out I, and, n- now I have to go see for it myself because I can't yeah. trust. I can't trust you to tell me my, that my untrustworthy half son is cheating, but I will trust my half son is not cheating because my untrustworthy half son told me he's not cheating. Yeah. And it's like it's like oh, what do you know? He is actually cheating, and also he sent his cronies to go murder Thor's girlfriend because yeah. that's a thing. So. <laughs> So so basically, it's like oh, I guess I'll send one of you guys to go stop that, and then I think just let. And then he, yeah, but then he just lets the race continue as normal without like just like. And then afterwards, like actually, Loki, you cheated like fuck. Yeah, with that's the it. power of the Nornstone. God, that fucking just constantly him going about Nornstones like for. And it could like, do anything. It does for literally 10 anything. Like the Norn, the Nornstone goes like this will stop the fire. This will project an image of the future. This will become a sword. It does everything. It makes I, I, Julian fries. To be fair, though, that, that does actually fit with the mythology of, like, Loki just doing crap. And then Thor basically just but like... But why does he need the stone? Because doesn't that, he have well, magic I mean, well, already? That, that is part of the magic of the stuff. You know, that, that's, that, that kind of fits in. But then Thor, obviously, because that's his character, is basically just like... I'm just going to punch through crap, and then if when I catch up to you, Loki, I'm just going to beat your shit in, and that's exactly what happens. And yeah. I'm fine with it. That was fun. Like, I thought that episode was pretty – it was dumb, and but it was really lazy. It was pretty funny. Just, like, the logic. That's the thing with the, most of these, like, these, these episodes that we watched. There's just no sense of logic. It feels like it's an improv game where they just had to come up with one thing happens, then the other thing happens, but then suddenly they panic. They go, oh, right, this other thing in the past happened that we actually have to answer for, and then they just come up with a really quick fixed solution for it narratively. Yeah, like, and I'm, I'm fine with that for the Thor one just because I'm willing to write off, like, oh, gods magic. Are- dumb you know what i mean like that's like like that kind of fits with the mythology like if you look like say greek mythology stuff like yeah that that totally fits those guys were idiots you know 
Like that 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 fits. I'm willing to write that off of a sense of like, yeah, perhaps Odin should like you know stop letting Loki back into his house every five seconds. Like, hey, let's talk about the with the other episode where. Uh, Don't worry, where been- I'll leave to go to Earth. And and Loki, you will just temporarily take over here in case something happens to me. And if something happens to me, say that I die and Ragnarok happens, you will be the ruler forever. This will not be tempting to you in any way. Yeah, and it's like, okay, I'm going to go down to Earth to go talk with Thor to try to like, convince him to come back to, to, back to my fold. And it's like, he immediately leaves. The second he leaves, Loki sits in the chair like, I'm going to go summon some demons. That'll be great. He literally, he literally starts the end of days. Like, yeah, and it's me. All but the that second was he does it was fucking Fenrir. Yeah, <laughs> like, he, that's he, all the... that was missing. He literally, it's like Loki. Did you start the end of days? My bad. It's like that's well, how it ends. Well, basically that happens. But then it's also funny because everybody else, like uh, in like in like Valhalla, well, tra- or me, tra- like he transports all of <sighs> humanity to a different plane. Well, no, 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 no. that 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 happens. <laughs> that's what? Hold on. Not, not yet. Like, they, they basically, immediately when that happens, everybody in Valhalla is like, ah, uh, Loki's doing that thing again. I guess we should go down and, and tell Odin about this. And they go, and it's like, oh, oh, you know, I probably should have seen this was going to happen. And then Loki sends his demon friends or whatever down to Earth to do it. And then Odin sends everybody, like, freeze his time so they, they can have an awesome battle, basically. And I thought that was pretty cool, personally, where Odin's like, all right, hold on. I'm going to freeze time and send all the humanity to, like, a parallel dimension. And then we're going to punch some giant monsters for, like, five minutes. And that was pretty cool. I'm I'm kind of impressed that they're able to even have some kind of stakes on the outcome of the combat if one of the protagonists is able to freeze time and send all of humanity to a separate plane of existence. Look, Odin is <laughs> he is the all-father, okay? Well, yes, but does that means that all, all the battles that he's going to be in have a foregone conclusion. I mean, there's, it depends, it depends if there's the limitations about when they can apply it or whether he's willing to apply it. You know what I mean? That still feels kind of arbitrary. But but then again, this is what, you know, we're talking about the Gods. animated version of Come Thor. Come on here. <laughs> Gods are weird. I mean, yeah. and, but basically that fight scene was really dumb and stupid, but it was fun, I thought, and also goofy in how badly animated it was. Like, he punches oh, yeah. a flaming demon into space and, like, hits it, like, it hits, like, a meteor and then just it gets stuck there. It's like, oh, the meteor is metallic and magnetic, so the guy's made of flame, so he's stuck there. Yeah, because that's how magnets work. Yeah, sure. And then, and then like Odin just like kind of cheats, like, oh, the giant that's in the water. I'm gonna make like the ocean floor just like suck him down and like eat him. He, I think he just made the oceans rise and just take him. Yeah, something like that. And then there was another character that I can't remember, and that that one was also beaten with a sword or something. I don't know. So was it really that awesome? Because it seems like every single answer was, uh, Odin just uses one of his powers and cheeses it. Okay, it was dumb, <laughs> but it was dumb awesome. In the sense, like, I don't think it was particularly good in the sense, like, oh, oh this is something to tell your children about. But I, I enjoyed it for, on its own sense. Like, I'm willing to let the Thor one, again, get away with this type of crap. Yeah. So there was that episode, and then there was also the Hercules episode, where essentially this Odin was like, oh, actually... Um, I'm gonna like take away Thor's powers, and I'm gonna have to convince Hercules to like steal his girlfriend, and that's basically kind of how it goes up. But then like Odin, like Thor has to fight Hercules, and the whole thing is like basically trying to teach Thor, <sighs> teach him humility, kind of like humility, yeah, kind of like humility. The sense like, oh, you see, you you need to ask for powers if you want to, you know, save your girlfriend from asshole Hercules who interestingly behaves exactly as I would expect Hercules to act, you know, and also how he basically acts in the comics. Like the whole characters for this cartoon for the, for the Thor ones pretty much is exactly how they are today. And like in all the various Marvel media, you know, like the movies and everything. And basically, you know, just kind of like a humility teaching type thing. And that was a very fun one, but there wasn't much else to it. Like all of the episodes need to be based around Odin trying to teach Thor to not be, so into the human lady and also try to get him back into the fold. And then occasionally Loki will convince a wizard to help him do something. So it's basically just conflict through Loki obnoxiousness. Well, that and just, you know, the conflict between Odin and Thor and Odin trying to get Thor to, you know, follow his way. Whereas 
Thor has decided to live with humanity. Yes, but his way of going about it is is oddly passive aggressive. Yeah. For an ancient god of thunder. Yeah. So, about the Hulk episodes. Jeez, so the Hulk episodes we watched were the first episode, the origin of the Hulk story, which also went into some weird stuff involving the Gorgon. And we also watched one about Toadman. From space. From space. So the origin story is kind of just the origin of, you know, the Hulk where Bruce Banner walks into like a radiation field or walks well, into he a Well, sa- he saves a teenager who's like, it's a free country, man. I could drive out to this nuclear test site. It's a nuclear test site. It's a nuclear test site. No one told me. Yeah, then then, then Bruce gets shot full, full of gamma rays, and then he gains the power to be the Hulk, basically. And yep. the Hulk's kind of the expression of his like internal fears and wanting to be a you know, badass type stuff. And he turns that night like into a werewolf? It's well, I mean, he's like a were-hulk, essentially. <laughs> a were-hulk. <laughs> yep. And then, like, uh, there's... What, what's the girlfriend? Betty? Another non-character who kind of wears a Jackie O hat? Yes. Yeah, Betty... And then her dad is a general of some sort? Yeah, Th- yeah Betty Ross and Thunderbolt... General Thunderbolt Ross, who's just, like, all military men. Like, ah, you need to hurry up this bomb test. Safety? What's safety? Ah, I'm gonna smoke my cigar over here. Tell me when we get to blow stuff up. I'm gonna I'm a call in my tanks. That'll be good. There's a Hulk around here? I'm going to call my tanks. Let's shoot them up with tanks. I got to beat up more weapons to beat the non-Russians because it's not Russia and it's also a steel curtain, not an iron curtain. Yeah, and the whole reason why <laughs> Bruce gets caught in that nuclear test is because, like, a guy Again, a with a vaguely Russian accent named Igor keeps on tell- asking him about the nuclear test. Then when when Bruce goes out there to save the kid, he's like, actually, go... go Everything's ready. Go ahead and fire the bomb. You know, thinking that you'll kill him off and you'll be able to see- steal the gamma ray secret from his room. So immediately, so Bruce turns into the Hulk, freaks out, blows up, knocks down a few buildings, starts m- murdering people or whatever he does. And Teenager then, follows him because, well, I'm Well, you help me and, now. And, I got to help you from now on. And he's an orphan, so, well, you know. <laughs> that, that, that line of dialogue was pretty funny. It sounds oh, yeah. like... It's like, nobody's ever showed me any, you know, treated me good at all. And I'm an orphan. All and right. And he says his full name before he says he's an orphan. It's like, I'll follow you forever now. <laughs> and he does. I'm like a lost puppy. And he does. And Hulk doesn't never recognizes him any time that he turns into the Hulk. Well, it's like, he I'm forgets. your friend. Don't you remember me? It's Hulk like, has no friends. The like, Hulk met you like two days ago. Aren't you presuming too much? No, Hulk but... needs personal space. You're a little bit clingy. <laughs> <laughs> Hulk no need puny. P- <laughs> but anyways, so Hulk goes in there, beats up the Igor guy who's like rustling through Bruce's stuff. And it just turns out that Igor is, oh, given his Russian accent and his name being Igor, is a representative or a spy for secret, not communist organization, whatever it is. That basically is, but, you know. Uh, and then, so he, he's arrested, but then uses a transmitter in his thumbnail Which to send course. a message to the Gorgon, who basically looks like a an orange thumb covered in Cheeto dust. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> Who's wearing, got, wearing I'm, a I'm fall, the Gorgon. Uh, I'm evil. I'm like a Hulk. I'm an evil mastermind. Yeah. Like, he makes it, that sound all the time. And he makes it all the way to the U.S. with no one noticing it. He just, like, flies, like, a, like a pl- tiny little plane in the middle of desert there. Like, I heard, because he, he, someone tells him from his transmission, like, there's a monster that the U.S. have that's called the Hulk, and he's even and, grosser than me? That can't be. I'm going to go show him up. There can only be one. Only one gross, weird mutant man. Wait till so he, he hears me- about the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not even go there. So, so he gets there and he, he's like, so he's like, ah, so you're the Hulk, and it's like Hulk's like, I'm gonna beat you up, and then he shoots him with mind control bullets. And he shoots him and the teenager because, like, with these two, I can't possibly fail in taking over the world. A teenager, orphan, and the Hulk. Yeah. So he just takes some mind controls them, takes them over to Russia. And then immediately the Hulk turns back into Bruce Banner, and then the Gorgon has like a meltdown over this. Like, wait, 
Oh, you are the super genius, Bruce Banner? How can this be? Oh, what a cruel, weird thing that you would have an alter ego. And, and then, then you could turn back to normal. And I'm so ugly and deformed forever. Can't you fix me? And then he's like, I can fix you because, uh, Question science. mark? And like, it happens off, like, frame. Like, oh, he's human again. Too. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you home, okay? And then, then like, he's, he's human now, and his superiors immediately, like, we're not even like conflating for time here. Like, immediately, his superiors call him, like, oh, what, what were you doing with your evil plan? Like, I don't follow you anymore. I'm gonna go blow us all up, and then blows himself up in a nuclear explosion. This all happens within thirty seconds. Well, like, uh, so, so this is how I remember it. So he sends them off immediately after he's fixed. And he looks normal. Then he turns over to a picture that is basically it's it's not Stalin. It's not Stalin. It's it just looks kind of similar in composition. He's like, I renounce you and everything you stand for. See, it was an American scientist who made me look good again. I denounce you. And then the guys stumble in, going like, What are you doing? Wait, you're the Gorgon. Yes, and then he just blows him, them, him, and everyone else all up while the in a teenager, nuclear explosion. In a nuclear explosion, with, while the, our protagonists get away in a rocket. Yeah, and then and then and then the whole emotional kind of moment at the end. It's like, oh, I'm not the Hulk now, but when will I be the Hulk again? And then the episode ends. Like, what? what? Like, but, what but is, if we that? just if we just showed that he could fix someone's like, I guess, nuclear related deformity with no real thought process and i guess soviet technology how, how how does the whole thing still remain a problem for him well yeah either that or it's a sense of like what was the whole point of like the juxtaposition when the hulk had nothing to do with like the actual resolution of the plot like he never had to turn into the pul- the hulk to ever have resolved that like if he'd just been kidnapped there was a scientist and like hey i can fix you like you never would have need the hulk plot line in there at all for the purpose of like the, the the gorgon plot Yep. Oh, he and didn't do not, anything. And let's not forget that in the end, it's also implied that Igor is killed in a state-sponsored execution. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he'll <laughs> suffer the same fate of all spies, a bullet in the head. Or a needle in the arm. One of the yeah. two. But and then, then the other episode we watched was the oh, Toadman. Oh, let, let's also not forget uh, one of my favorite aspects of the Hulk, and it's particularly in the Hulk episodes visually, is the way they illustrate running is just literally sliding the background behind them while the characters remain completely 100% stationary. They don't even move their arms. They do not move their legs. They don't even move their mouths half the time. They are literally just sliding like ice across the landscape. <laughs> As was joked, like, all the, these episodes, specifically with the Marvel superhero show, it, it, all of it begs you to have a slide whistle as everything happens. Just constantly being... Like, because it's, it's hysterical how much there are just, like, people sliding across frames. Like, there's multiple scenes of, like, inserting people running like that. And the Hulk one is the worst for it. By far. Well, that's because the characters change location a lot more quickly, and there's a lot more rampage moments. So therefore, he's supposedly walking through as a path of de- you know a path of devastation, which we don't see. Yeah, and also th- the Hulk one also reuses stuff that doesn't make any sense. Like, there's a lot of things where they have conversation pieces where they use like you know things of Hulk in prison from like earlier portions of like one episode and they'll use it for like a normal conversation where he's behind bars and it's like wait why is he behind bars now wait why is he looking out the window here wait why is his clothes normal here wait she's hugging a guy that isn't that isn't Bruce there but it's supposed to be Bruce but that's her dad that she's hugging there there's so much that's reused animation that makes no sense whatsoever well there's no continuity that's yeah, really what it is. Like from so shot to confusing. shot, it's yeah, it's well, it's because again, they're just using panels from the comics, and even if it's not even in sequence from the comics originally. Well, with these ones, it's not even reusing. Well, it is reusing panels from comics, but it's reusing panels and shots from the previous episode, like the previous half of the episode, and they don't have to make any sense in the context whatsoever. Well, it's like okay, there is a method of filmmaking doing this so there is a film by chris marker i think called uh, la jete which was literally a sci-fi film constructed by using still photographs Mm -hmm. and then they're just one after the other it is entirely possible to do a kind of animatic or storyboard and it's it's a common exercise in animation training to take a existing comic and see can you cut 
can you scan and cut the panels together to make like a film that makes sense? It is possible, but that requires effort and sometimes redrawing something or flipping it and things like that. That's not what happens here. I, I don't I don't know if there was any real filmmaker going behind the scenes at all on this, but like there's some basic competency issues. Like the 180 degree rule does does not function. It does not happen in this universe at all. So it 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 becomes visually confusing most of the time. Yeah, I have to imagine just that they were operating like I'm sure the people involved had skill. I think it's more that they were li- well, lazy or super cheap or they had like like we've got 10 bucks what can we do with 10 bucks like well i can crank out an episode in a day and that's basically what happened well they they might have been artists but they weren't animators or they weren't filmmakers like no, I, you know the, 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 i don't know like, the, the, like, like you said they literally made the spider-man show the next year yeah they then learned to animate between the span of a year, assuming that they had the same well, animation staff. Again, here's the thing: is I think so. I guess we can move on to Spider Man. Wasn't great, but in but Spider Man, but they it was were animated. good artists. Like they knew how to draw faces and they could draw certain poses really well. But when they had to make them move, it just looked really bad. So again, I think they might have had talented artists, but they weren't good at making them well, the move around. Was or... pretty, it was fairly well animated. Like it wasn't great, like in the modern sense, but it was animated. Like it had, you know. Scooby Doo level, you know, things of animation going on in the Spider Man uh, cartoon. Scooby Doo is animated better than this, I think. I Certainly, mean, the, but I mean, it was the characters didn't yet. didn't like. The, I would say the animation for the Spider Man stuff is the equivalent of when you see a CG character clipping into itself randomly. Eh. It's there are moments where it that is it's the two D equivalent of doing that. Like there are points where. The way oh, they got from one drawing to the all next. The time. I'll give well, you like that, when they but... the way they transition from one pose to the next, the in betweening, sure. it's like either really straightforward or randomly the poses will change. There's a lot of places where like even Hanna Barbera did a better job than that. Well, but again, certainly... this is also before, you know, Hanna Barbera was doing their stuff, and these guys had probably a fraction of that already fractional budget. Yeah, but back to the Hulk. Like the other episode we watched was the Toadman episode where. Uh, what is it even worth going too much into the detail with this episode? Because it was well, because so it goes weird. nowhere half the time, and they kind of forget that there's an alien invasion going on for like a good part of the movie. Yeah, because like like Toadmen show up, like or okay, so it opens up with 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 Bruce Banner and young friend whose name I forget constructing like a prison underground for Hulk to go into at night, so he doesn't go like punching stuff. And they're in a cave. But then the Toadmen show up in the cave like, we're going to kidnap you because we want you to tell us about, like, the military presence on Earth so we can invade with our gravity control stuff. Like, you better tell us or we're going to, you know, mess with you. It's like, and then the, Bruce Banner's like, yeah, send my friend home and I'll tell you. Like, okay. And then Bruce turns into the Hulk. He beats up the, the, the flying saucer. It crashes. The, the military show up at the crashed flying saucer the the toad men dig into the ground to hide, and then they find Bruce Banner inside. Like, oh, Bruce Banner clearly is working for aliens now. Why not? They arrest him. He goes into prison. Night comes. He breaks out of the prison. Everybody forgets about the whole toad man plot for a while, even though the toad men are like are moving the earth, the the moon closer to the earth to you know kill like millions of people. Everybody forgets about that for the bit because the Hulk's out and he's, you know, punching buildings. And not just that, the Toad Man show up on, like, screens and everything else announcing what they're doing. Yeah, so like, hey, we're like moving they're... the moon closer. You can see it. It's fucked up. Yep. And so it's not even like they can blame all that on the Hulk. Oh, the Hulk is, like, almost non... non he's just entirely incidental to what's yeah. going on. This major global catastrophe that's killing millions of people. They're like, the Hulk is is walk, is sliding through that forest. Who cares? It's like you have to imagine like someone else on the side of the phone being like, who cares? You know, what? bigger issues at the moment. And then Hulk goes and like he, he scares Betty. And they're like, oh, no, Betty. And then and she Hulk faints because turn- that's yeah, and what then Hulk turns back to do. Bruce. And then Bruce is like, oh, well, that was weird. Hey, hey, Betty. Hi, it's me, Bruce. My shirt got ripped. Uh, bye. And he just leaves. And then he makes a, like a gamma ray that causes the aliens to float back into space, kind of. And then and the episode only ends. the aliens, and that's it. Yeah, then the episode basically ends with like with Hulk going into his, his cave prison, like, ah, uh, uh, nothing to do but to wait to turn into the Hulk again, I guess. Ooh, and that's it. Yep. 
And again, it's like, it, the Hulk it just, once it again had nothing to do with the resolution. <laughs> well, it just completely forgets its own plot. Yeah, and also like the Hulk had nothing to do with like anything with the resolution here. It's like Bruce Banner is so brilliant; he uses brilliant science to do science stuff. And it's like okay, well, and then, the Hulk thing. And then, they, and then the U.S. military just conveniently forgets they found him in the wreckage of this flying saucer to begin with. Well, no, they they forgive it. Like, oh, well, we might, we should have trusted you when you said that you got kidnapped. I guess. Thing so you helped kill us, kill all these aliens, which is a fair point. There was no reason for them to blame him for that. Like, like they think it was his flying saucer. That was weird. It was it was just a weird episode, and again, none of the characters' decisions make any sense in any way, shape, or form. Even when they try to explain why they make the decisions, there's still no logic or explanation for what they do or why they're doing it. And they use the same like two shots of the Toadmen like repeatedly again and again, just looping it for time on time. It was oh, and their their blinking is hilarious. I don't know uh, how no, they made blinking funny, but they made nothing, it nothing. Their blinking is nothing on their mouth movement because there are right. certain side shots where they just like just like they had a still of like the Frogman and they just drew like a like a noodle mouth on it, like like that, like just the weirdest like animation, just like and half like, the time it, it looks like they're screaming too. It's like they got like an intern to do it in like for like two minutes. Yeah. Well, they probably only had two minutes. Like, yeah, it's like I'm not, like, <laughs> wouldn't even blame like the staff on it. Like, like I have to imagine they were just super under budget or something or like no time. Like, like how how long would it take you to make one of these episodes? You would think if you had the the hardware like to do the scans, or you if had, you had like comics. if I had staff, it would probably. I mean. To make if you had like, say, like, say you had like five dudes who had the scan hardware and they gave you the comics, like here's the the comic we want you to do. Probably like a day or two. Like it doesn't take that long. Yeah, like I don't think it would be that hard because so much of these are holding the shot so long. Like you could probably do it in like a few days. Like I could probably do most of the stuff in here. Like some of the actual stuff where they're animating, I probably couldn't do because I have no talent. But, but with modern some... software, that helps a lot. Like back well, then, yeah, they didn't I, they, have that. They had they yeah. used the equivalent of a photocopying machine to put it onto a cell, and then no, they there were there was it. some actual animation here where people move, like have limbs moving. Well, yeah, but I'm just but saying then in at general, the same time, then the... they'll be they'll be merely followed with one animation where it's just like boink, where they just move to a shot of like someone punching someone with no actual transition between them. Yeah, everything's implied because it's between panels. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird how they mix having actual animation and just having those hard transitions like that. Well, again, it's all arbitrary. They didn't seem to know when to use animation and when to not bother. Like, there's Mm. times where the movements are, like, there's no reason for it to bother moving. Whereas in other cases, they should have this animated. Like, they didn't have someone making intelligent decisions on, like, when they could use a still and when they didn't, and when they needed to have something drawn. Mm. Like, that was the big thing. And, And also, the colors were never the same given like even in the same location so color being a really nice key of of helping people understanding what time of day it is where things are located the mood it's all over the place it's the colors are just so spastic and random half the time and again it's this is what happens when you don't have a production designer and you just you you let someone improv one scene to the next visually, essentially. And of course it's going to come together kind of hokey and horribly when that kind of thing happens. Yeah. But again, we can move forward to Spider-Man where they kind of fix that problem by not using existing panels, but uh, still uh, they reuse a lot of their own footage. It, it is hysterical how the animation is still in Spider-Man though. Like it's, it's not super high, but it's not. There are they are actually animating it in Spider Man, but it looks hilarious. So I'm sure if, if any of you guys have like seen like certain stuff, like a lot of people probably have seen like stills and screenshots of 1960s Spider Man. Just because oh, there, of how it's silly memes. it is. There, there, there are there are millions of memes and animated gifs. It's kind of famous at this point for being really poorly done. You just just weird. And the first season is almost entirely based around like random episodic adventures. That it's a sitcom, really. It's a sitcom, but the funny thing is, like, it's not even really centered around Peter Parker or Spider Man. It's centered around J. Jonah Jameson, like the the newspaper editor. It's a completely obsessed and centered around him, and it's super weird in that. 
Like, well, it's also weird is it's hard to tell that he's even a newspaper, like a newspaper man, because some of the stuff they have him being responsible for and doing is like, why, why is he doing like a diamond trade with, with some guy from like, why, the was, why is he helping with like escorting weapons for like the government? Like, why, why is he in a clock tower trying to fix like a. It's like, wait, why, why is he making, like, a anti-Spider-Man supervillain? Like, like what? Like, like he, he's, he, he's, he doesn't even, does he even do reporting? Like, what is I his think, well, job? Why is well, he to be doing part, part, this? To be fair, a lot of his character is just built around the fact that he fucking hates Spider-Man on principle. Like, I, you can't trust that guy. He's like a spider and a man. Rah! I can't handle things that are more than one thing. And he's just he's a fucking douchebag, and that's really a lot of the appeal of the first season. It's just Jay, just you know, JJ just doing dumb stuff and being like, ah, it would be better if there weren't women and there were just children and men. That's actually literally a line he says. He yeah, I know, and it's great. And he's just sexist. smoking a cigar while doing it. <laughs> and then later on, it's like, well, you should apologize to being a dick to your, your assistant. And it's like, ah, me apologize? Ah. I've got too much money to apologize. I gotta smoke more cigars. Fuck you, Peter. <laughs> Fuck off, Parker. And I got better things to do. That's his delightful catchphrase. Fuck off, Parker. <laughs> he might as well be, because he's kind of like, like, shouldn't you be taking pictures? I gotta smoke more cigars. Like, he's kind of like, the, the, he's, he's fitting brilliantly within, like, the stereotype of, like, the self-made, like, kind of businessman type. Yeah. The, of, oh, yeah, that you had for the longest time of the sort of thing, you know, with You just know he has copies of, like, Atlas Shrugged under his table. Well, yeah, the, <laughs> his desk is probably made out of them, and he's probably just kind of like, yeah, I got a, I got a sweet deal to make money here. I'm helping the government smuggle weapons. Yeah, I'll be great. This is what a newspaper owner does. <laughs> yeah, it's cer certainly what he does. And basically, the first season has a bunch of one-off episodes, like, tied into various villains from Spider-Man and... Some, some of them well-known, like you have the Scorpion and Electro and the Lizard and Dr. Octopus and whatnot. And then there's also weird episodes where, like, Spider-Man fights, like, a centaur or, like, like some guy with a violin. or They're, or they just, of, they're just or, grasping at straws because they just need ideas. Like, there's, like, a, a, I mean, there's I'm like sure a dartboard these... with nouns and they just hit a couple. Well, of... a lot, most of those are actual Spider-Man villains that are established at this point. In really? our big someone, yeah, most... someone someone planned that out and came up with those concepts as characters yeah, like, and you're like, yeah, this like, is good. Yeah, you have like the Rhino is an actual character, you know, Mysterio is an actual character, Scorpion is an actual character. And the origin of Scorpion in this is basically the origin of Scorpion in the comics in the sense that J. Jonah Jameson pays money to make like his own Spider-Man basically to kill Spider-Man and it ruins the guy's horrible life because he's stuck in a fucking scorpion suit and is a horrible mutant now. And now I'm going to go off and get buy some blood diamonds. <laughs> yeah, and it's like JJ, JJ just gets so off on it. It's like, ah, whatever. I guess I ruined this guy's life. <laughs> go send him to prison. I've got better things to do. No one I ever to... investigates my crimes. Yeah, exactly. It's like, ah, oh, well, I, I guess I shouldn't have paid money to get that guy turned into a mutant. Rah. And Spider-Man continues to work for him. Yeah, well, just like Spider-Man. And like... save him. And saves him. And, well, okay, to be fair... J. Uh, J. Jim Jameson does say please once, <laughs> once to please save him. I he guess he that, does pay it. Spider Man, and and the whole thing with Spider Man being a reporter is the sense that he can use his spider abilities, you know, and him being in the combat things to take photos of himself and sell them for money back to the paper, basically. But they never really show that. No, they version. don't really. They they don't really go into that aspect of it. They don't really go into much of any aspect of, like, the idea behind the Peter Parker character in the first season, because Peter Parker isn't really a character in the first season. He's this kind of superhero man who occasionally is snarky, and that's it. Like, there's nothing else to him. He's, like, kind of a dick, in fact. Well, the, almost all the characters are dicks. Yeah. It's a world of dicks. Yeah, except for, like, Peter's girlfriend or whatever. Who's well, she's a non-entity, just like all the other female characters in these shows. They're just yeah. non-entities. I mean, all these shows are just delightfully sexist in one way or the other. Yeah. They are oh. there to be to be assaulted, to faint, or to be angry at the men. Yeah, this... this Spider-Man also is great in the sense that it's also horrifically racist, too. 
Oh, yes. Let's talk about that one. Yeah, because there was an episode called The One-Eyed Idol where someone sends a one-eyed idol to J. Jonah Jameson. And then Jameson's like, ah, someone keeps stealing money out of my out of my room. Who could, uh, that's weird. And then all of a sudden his assistant, Peter's girlfriend, like, look outside your window. There's some horrible thing. And outside the window is a black person. It, it, not, not just a horrible thing. She calls him a monster. There's with, some horrible with, with the, per- person outside her window. And, and, it's and, like, and a bone. It's like, oh, dear God. It's like it's yeah oh, it's like no. it's a black guy like in like a, a loincloth with a bone through his nose and a spear who just like, ducks and, she, and, and hides. And again, the first word that comes out of her mouth is monster. <laughs> yeah, and then Spider Man finds him in the room later and calls is like here, doggy, here, doggy. Like what the fuck? Oh yeah, he doesn't actually have any voice or dialogue in it either, does he? I don't remember if... Yeah, I don't oh, and, believe so. And then we also discover uh, Spider-Man's kryptonite, Boomerangs. He is taken out by a boomerang, not just once, but twice. Look, and this, that guy and was before the good second time, he says, I'm going to keep a lookout for further boomerangs. <laughs> and he's still... What use is his spider sense? He can't dodge a boomerang twice. Look, look that man was really good with that boomerang. You know what you can tell? He was Australian. Kind of. <laughs> He, he was Australian, who was also an African big game hunter. And he found his, his aboriginal f- servant somewhere. They never explain it. They just, yeah. And, and apparently this tiki idol he sends to J. Jonah and Jameson is able to hypnotize him into putting money inside of it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, J- Joe, Jonah Jameson, I hear you got a lot of money. Keep putting money in this and then mail it back to me. Thanks. And he does it more than once. Well, yeah, because it's brainwashing. But like, what a stupid plan. Like, you can make a brainwashing shit. Why are you bothering with J. Jonah Jameson? Like, all of the episodes, every single one is completely centered on J.J. Like, it's absolutely just obsessed with him on every aspect. And I'm really glad that it is because it is hysterical as a result because he's a fucking dick. I, I just like that he's a cipher for every powerful person in that world because they don't want to have to design new characters or, or, or new backgrounds or situations. So it's like, okay, who would have a lot of money? I don't know, like a banker or some other really wealthy person. No, wait a minute. News, like, newspaper editor. We're going to, we're going to, we're going like, to, somebody walks in like, wait, I got a better editor. idea. What if it was JJ again? Like that's fucking brilliant. Do it. <laughs> we need someone to build an atomic bomb. Newspaper editor, JJ, they can do it. <laughs> There's a bunch of weird crap or like, there's some other episodes where, like, like they do a little bit more with Peter, where Peter interacts with, like, his Aunt May, where it's like, ah, oh, Peter, you're sick. Aunt May wants you to stay in bed. But JJ calls up, like, ah, Parker, I need to go take pay- pictures of this rhino. This rhino guy's stealing stuff from the airport. I know about the stuff from the airport because I'm also involved in this business deal. I'm He's flying stealing the guns. plane right now. <laughs> you should go catch him. Screw your, your, your aunt. Get me those pictures. Hangs up. You know, it's kind of like just... Ah, it's so weird, that first season. I was in the middle of struggle, smuggling drugs to the TSA, and I saw this rhino man. <laughs> I need you to take pictures, Parker. What's that? You got cancer? I don't care. That doesn't happen, but it might as well, because... God. <laughs> so much of these episodes are also just... There's a lot of these episodes basically just Spider-Man deliberately trying to fuck with J.J. as well. Well, I also like how... um. The way Spider-Man saves himself whenever he falls, and he falls quite often for someone whose entire modus operandi is to fly around and swing and be acrobatic. He always saves himself not by just, you know, what you'd think he would do, slinging a web against a building just like he does all the other times. No, he makes a parachute out of his web slinging and then also sometimes a uh, a propeller. Well, I mean, he's, he's got he's got the upper body strength to do that stuff. Listen, bud, you got radioactive blood. Yes. <laughs> I, I do. Here's the one thing that people will know from Spider-Man is that goddamn song. Like, that, that is like opening the most is famous one. All, all the songs are, are sound like someone is just improvising a song. Yeah, like, all, all the songs are the ones we watch are pretty good, except for, the, well, the Hulk one sucks. Yes. The Thor one. It sounds good. like a comedy. It sounds like a, a Hanna Barbera comedic version where he solves mysteries with a bunch of kids. That is what that Hulk song song sounds like to me. Also, because it also has a lot of stuff just while staring right at his ass. Like, oh look, it's Hulk's ass. It's, it's the Incredible Hulk. He's gonna smash it. 
And the Thor one is classic as well, like the Spider-Man is. That's another one that people may have heard before. But the Spider-Man one is just great because it's the one that everybody knows. Yeah, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, da 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 da. Well, do, does whatever a spider can. Again, these just feel like really like low rent lyrics. They're like, uh, Spider Man. He does uh, everything uh, a spider what, can. Whatever a spider can. So he makes like, webs, is he strong? He dra- drains people's blood. Yeah, and is he necrosis. strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive, radioactive blood. blood. <laughs> this is my favorite fucking line. Just like, just like, hey. What are you doing talking bad about Spider-Man? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. You will show him respect. I, I always like it when songs address the person aggressively. Like, hey, asshole. <laughs> it's like, look here. Look here, shithead. It's just, ah, oh, God. Just these, they're, they're special. And I, the origin episode is, so after season one, it transitions to being much more narrative. The visuals change. Um you get these psychedelic skies that look like they look like the swirling backgrounds and battles for earthbound. Like that is what the sky looks like in the second season of the Spider-Man yeah, series. The second season in general has like a lot more animation going on. Oh yeah. Or at least they're trying to do like more stuff that's less kind of goofy, like standing around like weird off faces. Like, well, the faces look shitty, but they're actually trying to tell a story with the animation and like, well, it's not that the faces the look shitty is they look fine. But then when they have to show another expression by animating from one pose to the next, the eyes just move across the side of their <laughs> the head. The eyes across the face the and like grow in the mouth. Is like, like their head, their head melts into a weird position. Yeah. It's kind of, like they didn't have like enough, like, uh, my opinion of the second season is that they had too much ambition for their means, their money, or their talent, essentially. Yeah, with, I, I will agree with you at least on this one. Whereas the other ones, I don't know how much ambition they really have. Yeah, well, like, with the origin, like, because basically after the first season where it's all just episodic stuff just entirely based around J.J. and, like, Spider-Man, like, fighting villains, like, classic villains. I, the second season, they actually go back and, like, oh— we're going to actually have a plot and like a through line to this because then it's like they go a prequel to yeah, the, first, the first yeah because basically the first like episode of the second season literally is just the origin story of Spider Man which everybody knows at this point basically it's like hey gets beaten by a radioactive spider decides to try to get a TV deal and he's a dick about it he lets a criminal go by that that has a gun like ah what am I gonna do and that that guy shoots his uncle. And well, then he goes I, and beats I, up that well, guy. What I what I love is okay. So not only in the origin story do we learn that Peter Parker fucking hates being called a bookworm. I will get them for calling me a bookworm. Someday they will Someday pay. Someday they this. will pay for for an offhand thing that I wasn't even sure he could hear because he walked away when the guy just said to himself, "Wow, he sure is a bookworm." What? And the then fuck second did you say of all, me? that a criminal who would. I guess rob a TV station in the middle of the city would then coincidentally go out into the suburbs and shoot an old man trying to rob his house too. Well, the the, the old man could have been. In, I think the, it was implied the old man was also in the city, right? No, because he it's he finds out when he gets home and there's a police car there. Well, the police car could have gone there to tell them about like, hey, your uncle was at the library. I guess, but I don't remember them mentioning that. So it, it just visually it implies that this criminal just happened to strike both a metropolitan area and then really far away in the suburbs. Yeah, but then, it would have made more sense if it was like, oh, you know, he tries to the, the uncle's you know driving a car and the guy just shoots him and takes his car. They, or well, something. they don't show any of it. It's never none of that no. actually is showed. I don't. Do they even show the uncle at all? Ever? Once, once, once in the very beginning, where it's like, oh, how's our adopted son doing? Is he studying? He sure is studying. Great. <laughs> Great, <laughs> that's it. And, and then and then Peter goes down to the docks to beat up the guy, and then the guy. Well, gets... no, no, he 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 goes. He gets the powers, and he goes to the docks originally just to think, because he rides his motorcycle. He stands stoically. It's like, what does this mean? Then he then he finds out more about his powers by uh, being accosted by thugs and breaking a light pole. Then he comes up with the idea of being the superhero. And then he goes. He finds out about the guy who killed his uncle, and then he beats him up, and then decides to do only good stuff. Forever, forever. And the thing is, while this is all happening, it's like, oh, this is a Spider-Man origin story and whatnot, and that sounds fair. They fit all of this into twenty-eight, like or twenty-two minutes. And the thing is, that's not twenty-two minutes of material we just discussed. Well, the twenty-two minutes of material. It it. 
Well, it could be 22 minutes of material if they had, like, you know, extended dialogue scenes. No, instead they fill up, like, five of those minutes with just panning across backgrounds and, and zooming then travel and sequence as well of him just it, webbing between stuff like for like five like minutes straight. straight or like for a straight minute at least for one of them it's just a, a one minute montage of like what the fuck is this it's like it's clear it's like they have the music the action music playing in the back like spider-man spider-man and like they literally basically loop through the song like twice yeah they they it's really like, it it's just a space filler. I swear they just did not know to what be. to do. They was like we need more time, so we're just going to constantly reuse all this footage that we had from the first season of him going around on webs. It and that's really the issue with the second season because like the other episodes because I've watched some of the other episodes in that season. It has a lot of that. Like they have like more plot going involved. Like the second episode of the second season that involves like Peter facing like like the mob and like the kingpin who have like a fake medicine ring. Where they they put up medicine that are these you know not you know it's like fake and not helping her and his aunt's sick, so he basically beats up them to get like the real medicine and stuff like and that's more involved plot wise and that's you know got but the, more it's stuff the going on. The pacing of that, and so it's like but it's the not pacing, the and then they still have like a five minute sequence of him swinging around on the way to like the docks again to go beat up some some thugs. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, what it's are like they they're, doing? They're spending their time on the most boring aspects of what is happening. Well, it's because like, they, they apparently didn't have any money, or like they they had to, they didn't have enough time to finish the episode or fill it in. They didn't storyboard it to figure out how much they needed to pace it to actually have it fill the entire episode. So they realized, ooh, we're short. Let's just shove more travel sequence in. Pretty much, I I I, I would more agree. More pans I think that's, around the background. I think that's pretty close to why. I mean, it could also just be that the original comics they're borrowing from just didn't have the parts that they needed to develop more, or that to or to animate or though. add those scenes would just have been too much work. So like the having those season... characters talk with each other in a conversation that lasts more than like two one liners would just be too much. Like I have to imagine the majority of the first season, like even. With the maybe some of those are based off of like arcs and stories from the comics. Like I have to imagine that the majority of the material in them is created whole cloth because I can't imagine that the comics were that obsessed with J. Jones Jameson as great as he is. Oh no. Like, I think, I think the first season was entirely just made for the animated. Series. I mean, a, a lot of those were based on, you know, like like villains, Well, based on stuff. villains, but I don't think there were actual plots or stories that were really a part of like what we would consider, I guess the canon. Sure. So I'm saying, like, they had the means, theoretically, to, you know, pad it out with original stuff if they wanted to. Like, stick in another fight sequence. Like, if they wanted to, they could have elaborated the fight sequences more, but they didn't. So they Well, just... that, that requires more money. Exactly. And so more I effort, think it's so... less a, a source material thing and more just a money thing. Yeah. I mean, this I don't think they were given a big budget. I mean, most of the television animate television animation, like, it took a while for people to to figure out, like, oh, right. This this requires money because the schedule of putting out these TV shows is much more intense than trying to put together a feature film. I mean, to be fair, this was fairly well animated and actually had more action than a lot of cartoons from this era. Like you, you talked about Hanna Barbera stuff earlier. Like if you watch like like a like a uh, Space Ghost or God forget bid a Birdman, there is like no action in those whatsoever. A guy oh, flies yeah. in and shoots a laser and then that's it. Like you know, like. The, these were actually well, the had Ralph Bakshi versions of these. So the the Spider Man season two and three, yeah, I think they're about you know a little bit beyond a Space Ghost. I well, think the first about, season even I think had they're about like a Scooby I think they're about Scooby Doo level. Yeah, yeah. Even the first season had you know a lot more stuff going on. Where well, it but had whether action, or not they like, pulled it off well. Yeah, I don't. I'm not saying it's necessarily <laughs> good action. Like like yeah, it stands up on its own merit. Like things at least happen. Like, there, yeah. there are fights, but most of the fights tend to go down to Spider-Man jumps over a guy and he knocks his head on a thing. Now he's webbed up. That's it. Yeah. And there's a little bit of mysteries going on and stuff. Like, there, there's more going on here than, you know, is necessarily what you would normally see from the era. And that second season, like, the it, it as cliche as the Spider-Man origin story is, like, in a generic sense, because, it, you know, everybody's heard it at this point, like... I have to imagine that that was kind of crazy for something to actually have on television in oh, the U.S. Yeah. in the at 60s. At the time, I think it probably was very like some guy, like your and... uncle was shot with a gun and is dead. Like now you're you know a villain or you're now you're a hero type thing. Like that seems kind of like crazy well, it, for it, something it, it for TV in the 60s. Well, I, I think it definitely approached darker territory and a bit more self seriousness. Versus again, I call that first season a, a sitcom because it 
basically is. I mean, continuity doesn't really exist. It's kind of centered around only like one or two locations just constantly, like that office. And a mm-hmm. lot of the a lot of the conflict is kind of based in a character's ego and silliness. Like and the stakes aren't really all that that high. Well, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, there's a few, there's a little bit of continuity in the sense that there's some reoccurring villains, like you know, they have. Well, they yeah, but I'm talking about in terms of cause and effect, like oh, something sure, that, no. That's what I mean. Continuity. There, there's is there's one certainly thing. no arc whatsoever in the first season to anyone involved. Like J J J still is an asshole. Parker is like super nondescript, super genius, and that's it. Yeah. He's super genius, and he's a snarky, you know, hero guy with you know a spider costume. He's like, he's a snarky dick hero, and that's it. And then, then whatever his girlfriend's name is, whose name I forget because she's not even a character, even less than those two. Like, there's nothing to her. She never changes. Like, nothing ever is dynamic at all. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I almost would have preferred them not to even bother including them at this point. Like it's all it's almost where no representation is better than the representation they're given. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's just it's so bad. All the again, all they do is they just faint or that's really they spend most of their time fainting. And being kidnapped and being well, like, in danger. Th- Thor Thor's girlfriend, she spent I think every episode I saw of, of of Thor had her fainting. Like she must I'd be worried about her brain. Well, that, that one's especially like, being funny because that often is not good for your brain. That one's <laughs> funny also because Thor twice in like the one episode where she's kidnapped and taken to Valhalla, he erases her memory twice in that same episode. Like I use my powers to make her forget this spooky shit that happened. And it's like, whoa, that twice in the same episode. And then in a previous episode, she was cast into an alternate dimension for like 15 minutes. Yep. This like frozen dimension, like of the, 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 with, with kidnapping rocks dimension. And, with rocks and fog. Yeah, it's like she just got locked in the, the, the mystery dimension for a bit. The land of wind and ghosts. Yeah. Again, that can't be good for her. Imagine not. Uh so yeah, the, these these are special. Um you can find these all on YouTube. Yeah. So if cause... you want to watch these yourself, they're they're pretty much all available on there. Um, I think you could also buy some of these on Amazon if you wanted to, but I'm not sure why you would I don't know why you would, yeah. I mean, this is one of those things you, it's really difficult to watch on your own because some of them just get very boring, honestly. Um, I like, think especially some of the second and third season Spider-Man ones where the pacing, oh it's just the pacing. It's, I mean, there's plot I, I there. Could... It's just that the way they meet it out in terms of just the scenes and cuts, it's just... It's dull. It gets it. It gets. It's a slog. It's like tales. It's like watch. tales of Earthsea, where it's like I. It's the pacing. Just you. You want to kill yourself halfway through sometimes. Like I'm pretty sure I could watch the first season of Spider Man again. Period. Just because it has so many goofy episodes and just kind of fun making fun of it with people. And same with all those like sort of the uh, Marvel superheroes ones with you know Thor and you know the Hulk. I, I could probably watch more of those again. But by uh, yourself well, would be a much harder. Well, by myself, would be harder. It'd be more fun with other people. I don't think even with other people I could watch the second season of Spider-Man again. Like, I've watched a couple episodes of that, and everybody I've watched with it wanted to stop. Like, people were literally falling asleep because it the pacing is so drawn out, and then it just has these, like, travel sequences and, like, panning over backgrounds. They're just, like, there's nothing to them. It is so dull because they just, they're just filling for time. Yeah. First season's great, though. Oh, yeah. I highly recommend people watch some of the first season with other people who are, you know, maybe inclined and may know stuff about, you know, Marvel comics or, you know, Marvel movies or stuff. Because it's really funny for that aspect of it. It's kind of like, what are they doing? What the hell is this? Well, do you have, like, maybe a specific episode that you would recommend? Well, Spider-Man? I would say the, the idol one is funny for the racism. Yeah. Uh, the Vulture's Prey is funny because it involves the Vulture stealing that rocket and hiding in, a, a, like, a thing. And then that also has the hilarious thing where he gets webbed onto the rocket. Oh, and this one also, and that's and that episode also has J. Jim and Jameson doing like three different people's jobs. That's yeah. the one with the like the the diamonds, and then also fixing a clock, and then. <laughs> but that's the one where he, like, like he gets stuck onto a rocket, and that rocket just stops in midair. It's like a fucking hovercraft. And he only is able to stay on it because Spider Man like webbed his feet to it. Yeah, Me- meaning his brilliant plan to ride this rocket would have failed entirely without yeah, Spider-Man. Yeah, and then Spider-Man turns himself into, like, a hovercraft. 
Yeah, that's the propeller. Yeah, it's pretty good. Like, almost all of the first season of Spider-Man, though, is actually pretty good. Like, you just, like, look through an episode list and be like, yeah, that sounds funny. Because even the dumbest ones are pretty good. Like, there's one where it's just, like, there's, like, one episode that's just, like, Spider-Man fighting a robot, and there's no plot to the robot. There's no origin story for the robot. It's like, there's a robot. Spider-Man, you better go fight that robot. How are you going to beat that robot, Spider-Man? Like, that robot's pretty big. All right, what are you going to do about a robot? There's, like, one where the Green ro- Goblin f- steals a witchcraft book from a magician and tries to summon demons. And it's just fucking weird. Which is weird, because isn't, like, Green Goblin mostly, like, he's a, he was a scientist, right? No, the Green Goblin is basically, like, a businessman who goes gets crazy juice on him. Yeah, but, like, is, wasn't most of it, like, his, his tools, like, you know... Bombs. Si- science-y and things like that? Yeah, yeah, bombs. Like, he, he uses money in his industry to, you know, industry's technology to do stuff. He do, does goblin stuff. So having him with magic just seems really... Yeah, yeah. And there's, like, a lot of weird stuff. Like, one episode that was really funny was a guy called Parafino, who's a wax museum owner who wants to make Spider-Man into his latest <laughs> exhibit. <laughs> that was really funny, and he, he hires a convict to... to capture spider-man and he tries turning him into wax and then it's just so much of those that first season just has weird just weird stuff this is really funny there's one where where spider-man fight fights the flying dutchman oh right right and that's a that's a mysterio episode because if anybody thinks about well that's something mysterio would do because he does illusions because he's an illusion man yeah in terms of um what would you prefer? Like, if you had to pick one of the series to watch, would you prefer, like, Thor over Spider-Man over Hulk, or are they kind of all at the same level for you? Well, at this point, I'd say, like, I've... If going in like from a generic sense or, like, from a personal sense? I think from a personal sense. Well, from a personal sense, I've seen all of the Spider-Man episodes that I would care to see, so I would, like, prefer to watch new Thor episodes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but from a more generic sense, I, I think the first season of Spider-Man is hysterical. Like, you, you think it's like better than maybe like the Thor or like Hulk uh, ones in terms of funny? I think Hulk. I don't. I don't. I don't know if the Hulk ones are even that good. Like that first episode was funny, like really kind funny. Of? Yeah. The, the, just because of how quick they like, I'm the Gorgon. Oh, yeah, you yeah. made me a human again, and he within thirty seconds kills himself and every like a, a million people or whatever. Well, like the the logic leaps. In, in Hulk are funny versus yeah, fast in, forward. in Thor, yeah. the continuity errors become so constant and frequent that they just, they, they become funny visually. Yeah, th- that and also... And the voices. The, the voices, voices are in great. Thor are really And also just all like the motivations for characters are just hilarious in Thor. And you're, and you're, it's easy for you, to, it's easier for me at least to suspend my disbelief for it all. And just kind of make up scenarios for why this is happening. Like, of course Odin is changing outfit every frame. He's a god. He could do that, maybe. And it's just funny to construct these scenarios. Like, up, oh, Odin changes outfit again. Oh, wait, look at Odin's bathrobe. That's hysterical. Because he looks like he put on a fur coat. Yeah, and he's for, got these huge his fucking, towel. like, his fur slippers on. And it's like, what the fuck is going on? It's, it's uh, so odd, trippy. Oddly suburban. Yeah, it's, it's super, the Thor is super trippy. But the Spider-Man ones, I think, just are so, like, they, they're a bit more, more coherent, and they're a bit better made, but they're also just nuts. The first and season when, of Spider-Man and, and, is nuts. and the thing is, is when you say better made, does it still mean good? No, God, this, no. The, everything we're talking about when we say good or bad is entirely relative. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I, I think the Thor ones might be a little bit more bearable in that they're so short and quick. Yeah, they're you, peppier. Where some of the Spider-Man them. ones, even with the half episodes of Spider-Man, some of those feel pretty like, ooh, I want those to end now. Well, like a lot happens in the Thor ones. Yeah, because they kind of they compact it. They're, those ones, at the very least, with the Thor ones, like they get shit done. Yeah, the like pacing they, is pretty decent. Yeah, well, it's very get in get out. I think maybe they might have understood how to work in that time format by then. I don't know what order these were in, but it feels like Thor was... I don't know. I, 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 I couldn't find any production lists, because the weird thing is, like, for, apparently with the Marvel superheroes one, where they had Captain America, Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, you know... Submariner, yeah. Yeah, and Namor. Like, apparently that aired originally over the course of two months, or, like, three months for yeah. syndication. And it's, like, 65 episodes. So I don't know if they, like... Because some of these were... These were all 
like apparently it was like five days a week these were being so like, aired I, ha- I have TV. to imagine like it was like part one of episode one of Captain America part one of episode one of Hulk part one of episode one of Iron Man part one of episode one of Thor so like five minute stretches and then the next day they did you know part two of episode one of Captain America and so on yeah like, I have to imagine it worked like that where they basically you you got portions of the episodes because that's why after the break it would recap the episode you literally just watched some of. Yeah, well, I think some of those were commercial breaks. Well, even the recap there is like even after commercial break, you don't have to recap the entire previous you know five minutes. Do yeah, you? true. Well, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. Well, maybe they thought really low of their audience and they didn't think that. I mean, <laughs> M- like, much like the aimed, characters like, in their own shows, they so have no memory. Knows? They don't remember what happened five minutes ago, just like all the characters in the show. Yeah. Yeah. But they're pretty good. Like, or yeah. rather, they're pretty bad. I, I they're would, they're I would bad in a good re- way. I would wholeheartedly recommend watching them with people. I mean, I'm certainly probably going to end up watching more of these with people personally, just because it's really fun to do so. And maybe we'll, if there's some good episodes later, we'll come back to it. But we'll see. Yeah. All right, so that was the Marvel superheroes from 1966 and the Spider-Man series from 1967 to the 1970. So uh, next week, we are going to be covering specific episodes of Captain N, the Game Master. And the specific episodes that were selected were Kevin in Videoland, the origin episode, Return to Castlevania, Happy Birthday, Mega Man, and Quest for the Potion of Power. And you can find all of these, I believe, on YouTube. And uh, you probably could purchase this, too, if you wanted to on Amazon. But it's another case of... It's out there anyway, so... I, I'm going to f- outright say that we're watching this entirely for negative factor here. It, I don't think anybody is expecting anything good out of this show. No, so don't don't invest money in, in, in this hoping that it's going to be a, a hidden masterpiece. No, we're, we're watching this because it's bad. And funny. Yeah. And suffering with us through the show will be a special guest, uh, Bob Bob Servomacki. He is a prominent games writer and a big animation fan, so it'll be a lot of fun having him with us that day. All yeah. right. So uh, if you want to contact us, uh, you can always email us at adthepodcast at gmail.com. We've been getting some pretty good emails lately, so thank you very much. You can also reach either of us through Twitter. I am at rymagnuson. And I'm at S.A. Zorak. Uh, if you subscribe to the show on iTunes, you will automatically get these episodes downloaded when we put them out. Uh, you can also uh, write a review, which helps give us some feedback and work on improvement and also just raises the profile of the show. So anything else going on? Mm, I don't think so. All right. What does it? So thank you for sitting through us again, and we hope you'll stay tuned for next week.